Paul, I think you're muted. Right, you are. So let me start again. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, nice to have you join us. Uh, I'm Paul Fekita, a Senior International Trade Advisor in USAID Center for Economics and Market Development, uh, which is in USAID's Bureau for Development, Democracy and Innovation, or DDI. Uh, welcome to this Market Links event, uh, which we've titled the World Bank's Trade Facilitation Support Program. What is it and how can it advance an economic growth agenda? I'm pleased to have Bill Gain from the World Bank as our primary presenter. Uh, but before I formally introduce Bill, uh, let me just highlight USAID's longstanding relationship with the World Bank. Uh, most recently, our office consummated an agreement to participate in the Competitiveness Through Jobs and Economic Transformation, or CJET, uh, joint program with the bank. Uh, USAID officially joined CJET as the third development partner in September 2022, establishing the Economic Growth Partnership Single Donor Trust Fund, which is associated to the CJET umbrella. In partnership with USAID's Center for Economics and Market Development, the initial set of grants funded by the EGP feature global knowledge in private sector development and competitiveness-related topics, with the partnership expected to expand to include regional and country-specific activities in the country year. So we have a long and very robust relationship. We've hosted webinars in the past focusing on implementation of the World Trade Organization's Trade Facilitation Agreement, or TFA, but this is the first time we've had the opportunity to focus on the Trade Facilitation Support Program, or the TFSP, which USAID helped create about seven years ago. For those of you less familiar with the TFA, it was an agreement negotiated uh, in uh, Geneva over the course of a decade, uh, culminating in its conclusion at the Bali Ministerial in 2013. Uh, the TFA itself came into force in 2016 after the World Trade Organization members went through national processes of ratification. Leading up to this period, USAID, along with a few other donors, recognized the benefits of creating a trust fund at the bank that could serve as a rapid response mechanism to support the ratification process, and then later uh, to support further implementation of the TFA, and thus was born the TFSP. TFSP serves as one of USAID's pillars for supporting the implementation of trade facilitation reforms. In addition to this effort, we have our flagship Global Alliance for Trade Facilitation, or GATF, and we, of course, have our more traditional bilateral and regional engagements, all of which advance the cause of improving the movement of goods across borders. Trade facilitation has many downstream impacts. It promotes economic growth and supports increased employment, real wage increases, and new wealth generation that can yield increased national revenues for mobilizing countries to support essential government services and democratic reforms. As I mentioned, I'm really delighted to have Bill Gain with us, who has been part of the TS TFSP from its inception. And I should note that he's joining us from around the world in Fiji. So uh, uh, it's uh, evening for him, and we're particularly grateful that he stayed up to be a part of this presentation. Bill is the Global Product Specialist for Trade Facilitation and Border Management within the Macroeconomics, Trade and Investment Global Practice of the World Bank. In this role, Bill leads the implementation of trade facilitation and border management reform in over 55 countries. He's had over 34 years of experience in undertaking management and leadership roles with a focus on trade logistics, trade facilitation, border management, and private sector development reform implementation in developing and conflict-affected countries. Prior to joining the World Bank Group, he was Associate Director and Manager for New Zealand and the Pacific at the Center for Customs and Excise Studies at the University of Canberra. Bill holds an MA in Public Policy from the Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, and a Postgraduate Diploma in Business from the University of Auckland, New Zealand. Before I turn the floor over to Bill, please remember that all of these online sessions are designed to support and strengthen the work that USAID does around the world, both directly and in conjunction with our partners. I hope that you'll come away from this presentation with a better understanding of the TFSB program and ways to engage with it and the other trade facilitation activities under EMD's purview. Please make sure to post your questions in the chat and uh, over the course of Bill's presentation and afterwards, we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. 
So with that, Bill, thanks very much for being here with us. The, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Paul, and uh, good morning, good evening to everybody that have joined this webinar. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to interact with you know a, a range of regions across the globe, um, all at the same time, and and it's a real benefit. And you know, since COVID, we've we've been able to leverage this uh, modality, I think, quite well. Um, and it's good to be able to share you know the work that uh, the World Bank has been able to to undertake in partnership with you know key donor partners, um, particularly USAID. And as Paul said. USAID uh, was one of the founding, was actually the founding um, donor partner for the, the design um, and launch of the Trade Facilitation Support Program. Um, and so again, uh, as Paul said, long partnership with the World Bank and key partner, particularly in trade facilitation, and not only at the country level, but also at, at many global international fora. Um, I have a presentation um, with, a, with a whole range of slides um, and I'll try and move through them reasonably quickly so that we can focus on discussion and questions and um, please uh, feel free to, to launch those into the, the chat uh, whenever whenever you, you can and we'll, uh, I think Paul will collate them and, and launch the kind of the Q&A session um, at the end. Uh, let me just start the Start the slides. Here we go. So yeah, that's the the agenda for today. A bit of an introduction, which we've pretty much done. Talk a bit about the trade facilitation agreement, um, and then move into, you know, what the trade facilitation support program is, and and where we are at with it after, you know, its inception in two thousand and fourteen, um, and then next steps and, and where it will go. Um, I've tried to include a few highlights. Tried to include a few uh, kind of results. Um, and a couple of media examples as well. And we'll have a little video on, on automation uh, later in the presentation. So the Trade Facilitation Support Program, as Paul said, it you know began in 2014 and it, its funding is sourced from nine donor partners and you'll see at the bottom there. So we have a range of uh, developed countries, international aid organizations, that have uh, have always been at the forefront of providing support for trade facilitation, customs reform, and border management. TFSP supports developing countries and least developed countries in reforming and aligning their trade facilitation processes and procedures and systems. And it takes a full and effective implementation of the World Trade Organization um, trade facilitation agreement. As you may uh, uh, have seen, international agreements often have a range of compliance levels. Um, but taking a, a, a less than full and effective implementation um, seems to be uh, the easy way out. So uh, in the bank, we very much uh, work with our client countries to find a way to uh, design a roadmap and implement processes, procedures, and reforms that will align to the full and effective implementation. The program has two main um, components. One is technical assistance, uh, where the World Bank Group helps reform uh, the facilitation processes, the laws, the procedures, systems, consultative mechanisms, and particularly the public-private dialogue mechanism which is to bring together the public and private sector. Uh, and the second component is actually the, the facilitation of knowledge between client countries, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning that we call it, and the measurement of progress and results. Hosted by the World Bank Group and supported by the donor partners whose logos appear at the bottom of the screen. So far, Implementation support has been provided to 56 countries, and I hope you see your country on there. <laughs> so please um, uh, let me know if you want any detail, if you see your country there and you, you want to see what we've done. Um, as, uh, as Paul said, I'm, I'm currently traveling. I'm in Fiji at the moment, and you'll see Fiji's uh, one of our client countries. But we have a fairly large footprint in the Pacific. So if there's any 
um, uh, attendees that are based out in the Pacific Islands, then uh, then you're welcome to jump in and, and ask me a few questions. I'll be moving from here tomorrow to Honiara in the Solomon Islands and then to uh, Port Vila in Vanuatu. So again, if anybody's based in these countries, there is an opportunity actually to meet me in person in the next few days. You'll see that uh, we focus uh, in all regions um, and with Sub-Saharan Africa being um, kind of the biggest percentage um, of, of activity. And so it's currently sitting at around 27%. Um, and then we have East Asia Pacific at 21%, uh, Europe and Central Asia at 20%, and Latin America and the Caribbean, 23%. South Asia is a little smaller, but it's only five countries. Um, and MENA, of course, is, is, is always is a much smaller given the, the nature of the Middle East and North Africa region. Partnerships and collaboration. So this is one of the unique modalities and, and critical elements contained within the Trade Facilitation Support Program, um, where we work very closely with all other international organisations, um, and we've kind of listed them there, very, very closely with the TFAC, the Trade Facilitation Agreement Facility at the World Trade Organisation, the World Customs Organisation, ITC, the Integrated Framework, um, and, and amongst others, all of the UN uh, organisations. Uh, particularly UNECE on the international standards and recommendations, UNCTAD around their customs um, as a CUDA system, um, and a number of bilateral countries, HMRC, and in this region, obviously, uh, DFAT and MFAT, and obviously uh, USAID and, and USG more broadly where it makes sense, um, also including the uh, Commercial Law Development Programme, CLDP. We worked in partnership with uh, with them in, in a number of countries, and most recently um, in Egypt. Um, a few examples. Um, we're working with STDF, which is part of the World Trade Organization, which is a sanitary and phytosanitary certificate um, kind of standard setting organization. So working around that agri-business um, cross-border trade dimension of trade facilitation. UNECE with the development and design of recommendation 38 on trade information portals. Um, and most recently, the time release study with the World Customs Organization. And that's a, a mechanism and a, a methodology for uh, looking at identifying and defining how long it takes for goods to cross borders. It's called a time release study. It's a measure under the trade facilitation agreement um, and the software and system is currently owned by the World Customs Organization. And however, we are in partnership with the WCO to take the methodology, um, revise it, expand it, deepen it, and allow it to become more of a whole of government approach to baseline measurement. Um, it traditionally, it started as a customs uh, software tool, uh, and in the future, it will become a tool that will be available for all border agencies. So I think uh, that is going to, to bode well for a consistent uh, way of defining um, a baseline for cross-border trade that can be aggregated and replicated across the world. So just a few slides now just about what is the TFA for those that, that may not have uh, had a lot to do with the the trade facilitation agreement. And just building on the opening remarks from Paul, um, you know, Paul indicated that, you know, it went through a 10 year process of negotiation. And, uh, and those that have been to the WTO in Geneva uh, would fully understand that it's no mean feat, that's for sure. But some of the, the, the benefits for, for both traders and the government uh, that have come out of this particular agreement, um, you'll see on the slide there. So transparency and fairness, you know, providing predictability, reduced time and cost for importers and exporters, um, particularly SMEs, and creation of a mechanism for accountability. Um, the public-private dialogue kind of mechanism is mandatory. Under the agreement, it's called the National Trade Facilitation Committee, and every member country must have one. 
huge benefits for, for government in terms of better compliance, more informed decisions, uh, better use of resources, um, and a, a more efficient cross-border trade. Better governance, reducing costs, delays, and complexity, um, and modernised border procedures and controls. So within the agreement, you'll find that the measures contained um, pretty much cover all of the best practices that you'll see, um, particularly around you know reducing costs of borders, implementing technology, implementing uh, automation. Um, some of you may have heard of the National Single Window, which is a discrete measure in the agreement. Um, and that is where all of government come together to, to, to manage the processes um, in a digitised way for the uh, import, export and transit of goods. Okay, now somebody closer to the mic, okay. All right, is that better? I hope so. It's got something on the chat there. Okay, so the internet here in Fiji is just sometimes in and out a little bit, so that could be why. Okay, so the TFA has three main sections. We have the technical measures, um, Article 1 to 12, and then we have what's really unique. It's part of the, the TFA and the first multilateral agreement to have this special and differential treatment provisions for developing and least developed countries. And it allows countries to identify where, how they need help and how and when they need to have more time. Um, and they're defined as categories, A, B, and C. And you'll see those in the next slides. And then section three is really just the institutional arrangements and provisions for the, the operation and implementation of the agreement. Next slide. Some of the key technical TFA articles, we have um, grouped in, a, in three kind of categories, really, transparency, uh, articles around the publication and availability of information, uh, criticality of the opportunity for the private sector to be consulted and to comment on information before entry into force of rules, regulations, um, uh, etc. Advanced rulings, um, common particularly in, in developed countries where traders can in advance receive a ruling from government regarding what they will need to pay and how goods will be classified before arrival. There's a number of other measures around impartiality and non-discrimination and transparency, and then a number of measures around disciplines and fees and charges. The second kind of big part of the agreement is really about dealing with the goods themselves, dealing with how agencies will come together to clear and process goods crossing borders. So release and clearance of goods, movement of goods under uh, particular regimes, like for transit or to be cleared inland, and formalities concerned with the importation, exportation, and transit. And these are uh, one article which focuses just on transit, particularly for landlocked countries. And customs cooperation, it's these, um, a couple of coordination and collaboration articles in the agreement, one around uh, between countries and one around between uh, ministries and border agencies. And then the National Trade Facilitation Committee is a, is a cross-cutting uh, measure. I mentioned earlier the TFA categories, A, B, and C. So this was the special and differential measures that countries could identify which of the measures they needed help and which of the measures they needed help in time to import, or sorry, to implement. So category A is where uh, the country identifies that they have implemented fully a particular measure of the agreement. Category B is where they identify that they need more time, but they don't need external assistance. And category C is where they identify more time and the need for external assistance from the international community. And this is where TFSP comes in as one of the, in fact, probably the largest program um, out there um, funded by nine donor partners 
to provide that support to LDCs and DCs to fully and effectively implement the agreements. Um, a bit more around those, the transparency provisions and the, the importance of the National Trade Facilitation Committee um, and the bringing together of the public and private sector uh, and the importance of this particular measure. Um, is, it, it weaves its way through the agreement um, to ensure that the private sector are able to uh, participate in all aspects of the regulation um, of cross-border trade. And it's particularly important for the Trade Facilitation Committee to consult with the private sector and ensure that the private sector identify the constraints to cross-border trade. And more importantly, also validate the reform and implementation of changes and reforms to increase the efficiency across border trade. The Trade Facilitation Support Programme, we call TFSP, um, I'll just give you a flavour, a bit more of a flavour around some of the work that we've done. So to date, since 2014, we've implemented 11 trade information portals and 10 single windows not fully, but in part, as a single window you'll see later, takes a considerable time. Uh, and we're, of course, the program is still fully involved in, in, in a number, about eight of these uh, single windows, as the time for single window implementation can take a number of years and a number of different instruments. And as Paul said, TFSP is a rapid response capability to kickstart um, and put in place uh, the preparation work. Uh, which can then connect to much bigger bilateral programs, such as the growth programs that you see um, being implemented through USAID and, and all regions of the world. 24 time release studies in 18 countries, including updated TRSs to create a baseline for measurement and monitoring and evaluation, risk management frameworks and authorised operator schemes, which is a program uh, to provide benefits for compliant traders. And if I can go into more detail on any of these things, um, you know, if there's any questions, just put them in the chat. Um, just to give you a, f a bit more of a detailed flavour of the TFSP support by a particular measure. As you'll see, the measures are listed on the left and the number of countries where we're working is on the right. So you'll see, um, if you do some analysis around the trade facilitation agreement, you'll find that the most difficult measures to implement tend to be the ones where we have the most uh, most number of countries. Um, and common measures that kind of uh, weave their way through all of the agreement and all cross-border trade activities, like risk management. So taking a risk-based approach for um, you know cross-border trade so that uh, government doesn't intervene in every single transaction. Um, and where they do, they, they manage the risk um, around the identified um, issues that need to be thought about, need to be contained, need to ensure compliance of. Um, and that is not just obviously in the, the, the efficient cross-border trade of compliant traders, but identifying where traders are non-compliant um, and providing a treatment to, for, to manage that risk. Um, publication is, is a big one for us. Um, information available on the internet. There's our trade information portals, um, fees and charges, pre-arrival processing. Um, and there might be another slide here. Let me see. The second slide you'll see. Um, formalities. So formalities is where, you know, all processes to import, export and transit should be the same. So kind of increasing efficiency around that, reducing redundancies, reducing manual processes, reducing documents. Um, and having that look the same, feel the same for the private sector, and SMEs treated the same, uh, particularly, you know, uh, from port to port and land border to land border. Um, uh, the National Committees for Trade Facilitation, um, we're doing that and, you know, supporting that in 34 countries. So that's probably one of the biggest measures that 
that will demand that we see from, from TFSP. So measuring an impact is obviously uh, critical in a program like TFSP. Um, and so at the project level, we use what we call private sector savings. Um, so this is kind of a bottom up um, approach. Uh, w during the design of TFSP, we, we looked at a number of methodologies and modalities, and we found it was particularly difficult to obtain good data consistently in a number of you know, conflict affected countries um, and least developed countries. So we developed uh, with our research group in the World Bank, um, this private sector savings methodology, which is essentially a tariff equivalent um, to uh, estimate what is the savings from time reduction um, for the private sector. And there's a couple of good examples there. Um, one in ECA uh, for 6 million savings across um, five or so countries. And in South Asia, 40 million um, across uh, part of India, but Nepal and Bangladesh, with the implementation of, of mostly automation, uh, improving risk management across a number of land borders. And those that know South Asia, it's the least integrated region and, and a challenge nonetheless, but with the right approach, you know, results are certainly achievable. And a highlight of the work that we've done was to, to look at how we could integrate a gender approach uh, within TFSP. Um, so looking at, you know, the, the a literature review of the, the trade facilitation and gender work across not only the World Bank group, but all other international organisations, we found there was a real gap around uh, uh, identifying constraints faced by women owned, led or managed firms. So we developed an instrument that is, is looking at uh, finding the data, uh, running the instrument, and looking at how to use the results around those constraints to inform the design and implementation of our program. Um, the data is really hard to get. There's no data available routinely because uh, border agencies don't collect data in a way that's sensitive to gender. So we had to look at active traders, so using customs data, and then uh, find a way to, to poll each individual importer and exporter to, to identify what the gender context might be. And then to look at a control group of male traders and freight forwarders and customs brokers to identify the common constraints between women and men and the constraints specific only to women owned lead or managed firms. Some of the, the, I guess, the kind of overall constraints that we see that are common amongst uh, uh, all countries surveyed, and we've, uh, we've done about six or seven in the Pacific, uh, another four or five in, in, in Africa, uh, plus uh, two or three middle income countries, which is, was undertaken in another program. We, had a, we used to have a middle income focus program. So we're looking at the, the, collecting that gender data and in India, uh, Brazil, um, and, a, at the, I think, and a couple of other countries are currently under discussion. Um, so again, we're seeing um, the constraints are, are common, and a number of them include lack of information or access to information, um, lack of opportunity to participate equally and fairly in the National Trade Facilitation Committees, uh, lack of access to programs providing benefits for compliant traders, like the Authorised Economic Operator or Authorised Operator programs um, that, that are available to compliant traders. Um, and just more generally, lack of awareness. Uh, women traders tend to just be, have a lack of awareness um, of uh, National Trade Facilitation Committees, as an example, um, or uh, how to access websites or different modalities around accessing uh, single windows or the trade information portals. Um, so again, these common constraints are now kind of mainstreamed into the design of the programs that, that under the TFSP. Um, a, an example of, of the work that we've undertaken in Lesotho is around the supporting the implementation of the national single window 
And this is a, a unique um, modality because it's actually a very small automated solution for a small country that required um, the development of a software solution to bring all border agencies together and allow for the connection of import and export permits, license certificates um, to, to be efficiently uh, automated um, and connected with the customs as a CUDA processing system. Um, so this was undertaken, um, the preparation was undertaken under TFSP uh, and the development of the software solution through a, a bank lending instrument. And so the leverage between a small amount of technical assistance and the much larger piece um, was able to be connected through the two different instruments within the World Bank. And it's one of the benefits of, of the World Bank and able to work with countries to apply a number of different instruments from technical assistance to uh, budget support when they're developing policy operations and then perhaps a lending operation for uh, something like you know automation, computerization, digitization, um, or the initial single window. Um, and you'll see there that uh, um, there's kind of a nice kind of description of what this was all about. Online portal for the application, processing and issuance of cross-border regulatory certificates, uh, licenses and permits, allowing all parties involved um, to lodge standardised documents through the single entry point. So that's been quite successful. So we're just in the process now of, um, of evaluating, um, you know, what that time saving has been. Uh, for Lesotho. So it's a nice example in an LDC country in Africa. And I'll just go back to that for a sec. Um, the, the cost of this uh, was, was, you know, between one and two million, as opposed to, you know, many countries where, you know, the cost on LDC from perhaps going to, you know, uh, uh, one of the big IT providers is going to be 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million. Um, so we've been able to find this solution that's cost effective um, and efficient um, and hopefully sustainable um, for LDCs. Um, achieving other results and other, I'll just do this very quickly, I see we're, we're, we're into the, over the half hour mark. So just a few results here. So Kosovo, we introduced the authorised economic operator um, uh, reform um, and that's, that's moving quite nicely. A number of uh, uh, AEOs have been certified. Um, and customs are taking that forward with a nice reduction you'll see in time. Uh, originally it took 24 hours and it's down to three hours, so that's kind of nice. Um, and time's reduced for 50% of at the borders and 30% at inland terminals. Did a transit agreement for, at, in Serbia um, at the border between Serbia and North Macedonia to create a one uh, process across that border and that reduced time from uh, 26 minutes to 10 minutes. Kyrgyz Republic, um, again, um, we looked at uh, procedures, reducing procedures and introducing, again, a trusted trader regime, um, and that uh, reduced uh, time to under nine hours compared to, to between 20 and 24 hours um, at the beginning of the reform. These are, I don't have a slide on this, but we did a similar um, transit agreement type reform in Central America between Guatemala and Honduras, uh, where we're able to create one simplified process across that border and reduce the time there from nine hours to nine minutes. Um, and we have, a, um, I think, a, a virtual reality video on that that's available on uh, the World Bank YouTube site. Trade information portal, uh, we talked about this a little bit. It's, uh, it's particularly important to allow for the increase in transparency and predictability for traders. And we developed software um, just over 10 years ago. First country that we did it in was uh, Laos, uh, Lao PDR, and we had the 10 year anniversary just recently. Um, and it's still going and it's still sustainable um, and still uh, producing good results. Uh, since that time, we've, we've uh, uh, introduced uh, and helped support the implementation in uh, 15 countries. Um, you see them all listed there. Um, and we're in the process of enhancing it to uh, the latest technology. Um, and that will roll out to all countries in the coming uh, six months. 
The Trade Information Portal is now an international standard recommendation number 38 uh, uh, in the collection uh, adopted and published by the UN uh, ECE. Um, and this particular standard was, was the design was uh, led uh, very much by the World Bank uh, with other international partners. Next one. Features of the new tool, improved search facilities, um, better user experience, use of app technology, uh, and use of API to collect uh, statistics and connect to many other international sources uh, to be able to increase the opportunity for traders to obtain uh, information and data. Um, the other kind of the, the big changes coming shortly. I have a little video here on uh, single window, um, which we can play very quickly, I think. Uh, Karina, you're going to play that, right? Yeah, let me share my screen very quickly. Can you go ahead and see that? Yep. yep. Good. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, the need for digitization has been widely accelerated. Traditional systems of trade are time-consuming, costly, and overloaded with paperwork. This is why the World Trade Organization's Trade Facilitation Agreement encourages its members to set up a single window, a path to paperless trade. A single window is an effective trade facilitation tool linking all relevant government agencies, service providers and traders, enabling them to exchange the required information, clearances and payments through a single online portal. Implementing a single window can have enormous benefits for governments, customs administrations, traders and the economy by making trade faster, cheaper, easier, more transparent and predictable. For governments, compliance with trade rules, improved resource allocation, better trade statistics and increased revenue. For traders, faster clearance times, lower operational costs, more transparent and predictable processes and less bureaucracy. For customs, improved staff productivity, enhanced professionalism and better coordination between administrations. For the economy as a whole, improved transparency and governance and reduced corruption. So, let's take a look at how you can start setting up your single window system. Step 1. Establish a vision. The government should lead the development of a roadmap. It should be collaboratively designed with the private sector and consider international standards. A strong roadmap will help secure public-private cooperation. Step 2. Computerize. Automate all trade documents and procedures. Start with a needs assessment to map out requirements and develop enabling legislation. Step 3. Automate the agency's internal processes. Select a contractor to develop a strong IT infrastructure that is user-friendly and includes an e-payment system for collection of customs duties and agency fees and charges. Step 4. Manage the change. Roll out the single window in phases. Provide a training and technical support program so that all your existing agencies and traders understand how to use the new system. Plan for continuous improvements along the way. Step 5. Promote uptake and buy-in. Engage the public and private sectors at all stages of the process by organizing training sessions and publicity campaigns. The World Bank Group is committed to helping countries with their trade facilitation efforts in order to create competitive trade markets. Single window, a path to paperless trade. Excellent. Right, right, I think I've got the presentation back. Um, so yeah, there's just a little video there to to like set the scene for what needs to be undertaken around the development of a single window. So we we do a lot of uh, visioning exercises with countries, think about what they need to do, how long it will take, and how to bring together uh, all of the border agencies to identify, you know, the governance and 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 the sequencing. Um, and we use this as kind of this video as a to set the scene of the visioning exercise.
Um, we've just launched also a um, a podcast series, and I there's one a month, and I think we're probably up to about five or six now. So um, again, if you if you have the time and inclination, please um, feel free to to take a note of the podcast series. It's available on all um, all the different platforms, um, and and it's uh, it just goes through um, all the different uh, components and around digitization, climate and trade facilitation, gender, um, and uh, and the more relevant kind of aspects of implementing uh, the trade facilitation reforms. Um, and it takes a very simple approach to 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 allow uh, all listeners to to understand and, and see how trade facilitation can be um, you know the tool and mechanism for economic growth. Uh, dissemination, so you'll see there that you know we disseminate widely uh, to all platforms, uh, leveraging visibility for, for all donor partners, um, and particularly our founding partner, uh, USAID. Uh, just a couple of last slides, just about, you know, this is not an easy thing. If it was easy, you wouldn't need the agreement, and the agreement would never have been agreed. Um, so it's a nice platform, it's a nice mechanism, um, and it allows you to to, to bring it all together and on the ground uh, when implementing, you know, reform to reduce that time and cost for the private sector. So just a few things about that kind of add to that particular um, perspective. Um, but the, I think the thing to really remember is that without the private sector involved, you know, you're not going to get there. So bringing together the public and private sector uh, in that collaborative way and partnership um, is, is the answer for not only the implementation, but the validation and also the sustainability. Um, but again, you know, the private sector can be difficult, just as the public sector can be. You know, getting the private sector together in a way that uh, have the same voice is often a, a challenge, just as it can be bringing together customs and quarantine or customs and standards um, together to have a have a similar perspective. Um, lessons learnt. Um, again, uh, just a few thoughts here around. Um, key lessons that we've learned across um, a portfolio of, of trade facilitation work. Um, sequencing is probably the number one thing. The single window is a good example. You two or three years preparation is required. Um, everybody wants a single window, but um, you know these are a lot of things that need to be put in place first. Um, obviously, you know all of the the things that we know: uh, political commitment, uh, high level commitment, uh, sustainability options in place. Um, having the law in place um, and bringing together a whole of government approach at, for every single kind of decision and, and design and not, uh, you know, breaking down those barriers um, between ministries and breaking down those barriers between countries where you have that cross-border uh, trade and opportunity to, to improve it. Uh, looking ahead, we're designing in the moment a trade facilitation climate impact monitoring mechanism uh, for ports and land borders. Um, so watch the space. And we're scaling up the design and implementation of our TFSP activities um, through the launch and mainstreaming of a border agency digitization gap analysis. So it's kind of like the single window blueprint, but the first kind of level one that kind of really gives you a feel for, for how to design the sequencing and then to either leverage into exist something existing or to to take a um, a fresh approach mainstreaming expedited shipments for vaccines medical food and emergency disaster related cargo so we've just done this in a few countries we did it in tonga just before the the tsunami so it was perfectly timed um and uh, kind of an impact measure there was uh the vaccine was coming in was taking you know six hours and uh it was it was cleared using this expedited shipments regime in, in a matter of minutes. And then integrating the supply chain and food security and safety into cross-border TFA implementation. Uh, Ukraine's like a case in point around uh, the importance and criticality of, of uh, taking that as a, a mainstream measure under our TF work. Um, that's it. That concludes my presentation. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Happy to have questions and, and discussion. And I think Paul's going to lead that. So back to you, Paul. Thank you. Well, thanks, Bill. Uh, thanks for that excellent uh, presentation. Um, 
uh, very, very comprehensive and uh, has uh, already generated a number of questions in the chat, uh, which I'll I'll turn to in a second. I actually wanted to lead off with a question of my own. Uh, Administrator Samantha Power has uh, emphasized uh, for USAID the importance of working on issues related to uh, 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 corruption. Uh, Anti-corruption task force has been created, and uh, the focus in that regard has been quite extensive. Uh, you, you talk in your presentation about good governance as being one of the focal points, if you will, of uh, TFA implementation, but I was hoping that you might be able to talk a little more about sort of the issues that arise and the challenges that have been faced in dealing with issues related to corruption since uh, we, we, we recognize that that's certainly a challenge in, in, in many places. So uh, perhaps if you could touch on that a little more, that would be great. Okay. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll kick off with that one then. Um, look, it's a challenge and, and uh, we all, I think we all know it and we all see it and we all understand it. Um, and there isn't an easy kind of answer and solution, but there's a number of um, initiatives and, and, and activities you can include in the design and sequencing of, of trade facilitation work. Um, and so, you know, some of the, one of the things that, that can help reduce corruption is to reduce the opportunity for corruption. And, and a number of ways to do that is to reduce the opportunity uh, for traders to have to interact physically um, with, you know, government um, offices and cu particularly customs quarantine um, at the border. And automation, digitization is going to be key for that. And we saw during, you know, COVID that, uh, you know, the digitization that was being resisted um, now is mainstream pretty much. In terms of the concept, not necessarily completely, um, you know, implemented, but it's, uh, the concept was, was commenced. Um, and now, you know, we're seeing that, that that's, you know, really helping with reducing the need for paper, the need to interact with government, um, and the need for uh, physical presence at every opportunity um, throughout the, the trade facilitation and border clearance process. Um, there's a number of other uh, initiatives that countries need to tackle to, to get to a point where they can reduce corruption. And it's not just in the trade space. It's in the public sector space. It's uh, having a good code of conduct. Um, it's about um, having, you know, a fair, transparent um, salaries and wages, um, you know, for, for government employees. Um, and also it's, um, you know, it's important to ensure that, that the opportunity um, is just removed wherever possible. Um, it'll never disappear, of course. Um, and, you know, there isn't one answer to it, but there's a, like, there's a number of um, international organizations that, that can support the specific trade facilitation work. I mean, one thing I, I learned, you know, very early on in the bank, you know, when we were, we were trying, you know, we're working, you know, in, in low income countries. Was that they, <coughs> you actually can't tackle corruption head on, um, you know, in a trade facilitation program, you're actually not going to get very far. You know, it's just going to close. And so you need to tackle it, you know, from a different perspectives so that you do get increased that efficiency, reduce the time and cost, but at the same time, you try to enhance, you know, the, and reduce the corruption levels. Um, maybe that's enough on that one yeah. for now, but happy to no, talk more hard. about it. So no, that's great. Favorite topic of mine, so. let, 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 let me turn to some of the questions in the chat mm -hmm. since we have quite a few. So from Ilan Gilbert, uh, does China participate in the TFA? Uh, to what extent do China's trade activities, including belt and road investments, complement or otherwise those of, of the TFA? Well, I can answer from the U.S. perspective that, yes, absolutely, China does participate in the TFA. Uh, but, Bill, maybe you can uh, elaborate a little more on their uh, sort of uh, role and interactions that you might have had. Yeah, sure. I mean, China's a member of the, the WTO, so they certainly participate and, and implement the agreement. Um, you know, they're a big economy. They have a number of lessons to share as well. Um, Shanghai Port's a great place. I mean, if you've ever been there, you'll see that it's fully automated. Um, but, you know, however, you know, they still have, have a reforms to implement. Um, during COVID, we did a number of virtual sessions with, with uh, different ministries in China. Um, to, to provide some, some initial support um, around you know, best practices. Um, and so again, you know, China's, um, you know, got a, a lot of uh, uh, 
potential to to be a you know a, one of the big countries in, involved in in trade facilitation as we know. Um, so you know leveraging the lessons across regions, I think is particularly important. Um, and China is one of the the big countries, obviously in the in the East Asia and the Pacific region for us. Great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, from Steve Norwood, uh, is TFSP technical assistance always welcomed by the targeted recipient country, or is there sometimes resistance or pushback? And then the second part of his question is, once a country has gone through the TFSP program, is there a graduation uh, uh, from the program, uh, any new credential <laughs> associated with the graduation? I'll, I'll actually combine that with another question that was posed by another individual, which is, uh, how is the level of implementation traced, uh, except through the declaration by members? I think those are obviously questions that are linked to each other. So maybe you can respond mm. to that. Yeah, no, good questions. Um, and uh, is there pushback? Look, I mean, it's demand-driven program. So, you know, we're, we're um, uh, you know, from the countries themselves looking for support. And it comes in a number of different ways. It comes, you know, via the World Trade Organization quite often. Um, through the, you know, the, the notifications of their C categories and needing support from international organizations. Um, and, you know, we're fully involved with, um, you know, with, with all donor partners and, and countries in Geneva as well. And so we get, we get requests there. Um, so, you know, we don't really get pushback because the demand's coming from them to us, but either through the WTO, through our country offices, um, or direct, you know, through the program or to, to me when, you know, when, when I, when I present it at various, uh, fora across the world. Um, however, you know, uh, it's not so much about pushback. I think the, the issue is about commitment, right? And so that's, you know, critical and we need to, to, to work together as, you know, the international community, um, to support, uh, all aspects of implementation to ensure that, that the commitment is there and the sustainability is there. Um, and, you know, I mean, these, you know, some measures of the TFA require certain actions to be undertaken. And so, again, the demonstration of their commitment, like the time release study, it's required to be published. If they don't want to publish it, they're not going to help. Well, not necessarily like that, but, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, we would like to push for, you know, for the, the full publication or at least part publication or at least a summary publication, you know, of, of what the time is for, for border clearance. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a key. Um, you know, transparency provision of the TFA around that particular measure. Uh, what is, what are the rest of those questions? That question, Paul was. Yep. Well, the, the just the, the general question of you know how is the level of implementation sort of traced? I uh, think that's a that's a general question that it was posed by yep, a number yep. of uh, folks. Yeah, no, it's a good question, and and we have what we um, and I didn't include in the presentation, but we have a um, a tracking tool, TFA tracking tool that that. We, we apply to our initial diagnostic. So we do a full uh, gap analysis of the TFA around the full and effective uh, implementation levels. Um, and then we upload this data into a, a database and provide it to the National Trade Facilitation Committee. And they can see um, visually uh, together with uh, roadmap kind of support um, where and how um, their implementation is status is and you know what are the kind of short medium and long term um kind of measures that they need to focus on um so that's one way to do it and the alignment so it measures the alignment to the tfa and so we report on that and i think over the portfolio we we were down at around the countries we're working in around 20 odd percent and i think it's up to 51 or 53 percent now across the portfolio so it shows that um, and I mean, the other, uh, you know, I guess measure is the time release study. So, you know, we'll, we run those as often as we can and, and at the beginning and then of course, towards the end of the program. I'll also put a plug in for the trade facilitation agreement facility that is run by the WTO. Uh, they have an excellent website that uh, provides a lot of information on individual countries and their level of implementation. And so, uh. That's another resource. I think if you're not familiar with uh, folks might want to take a look at. Let me, let me combine a couple of more questions here. Uh, uh, a sustainability question on the single window are fees tariffs uh, and, and tariffs used to pay for the software, hardware and content updates. And then, uh, similarly, uh, interoperability question on single windows. How are these single windows linked 
the digital government initiatives more broadly. And then uh, there's another question here that I think is a good one and sort of in similar vein. Uh, which approach has been used to ensure ownership and sustainability of trade information portal and single window projects, considering these require investments for maintenance costs after the projects come to an end? So, uh, all uh, related to sort of the ongoing uh, implementation yeah. of these provisions. Yeah, good question. And sustainability is a challenge, I think, in, in all projects. Um, and there's no easy answer again to, you know, to or, or one way of creating it. Um, single windows uh, required an investment, upfront investment, and then they require an ongoing maintenance, in, you know, uh, investment as well. Um, you can, and, and generally speaking, the only way you can do it is to build in a processing fee, um, which needs to be or reflect, obviously, you know, the recovery of the cost um, to government or to 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 you know provide the service. Now, and that's you know it's a TFA measure. It's also a GAD measure. It's uh, it's very important for uh, a country to be able to defend the methodology used and the actual fee. So it needs to 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 be commensurate with the actual uh, cost of providing the service. Um, we do in in Jamaica. We're just kickstarting actually the design of the method um, the methodology for for setting fees and charges around trade facilitation. And the TFA uh, measures around that. So th there isn't, uh, to my knowledge, any other country that's kind of got this in place in a developing country context. Um, and so I think this might be something that we can replicate as well. Um, sustainability of uh, single windows and trade information portals, um, you know, where there isn't that kind of set up with a, a cost recovery fee, it's a challenge, there's without a doubt. Um, when we implement, we usually, you know, we set it up for a couple of years and then we work very closely with. Uh, government to, to create a budget line. Um, Botswana is a really good example. Very quickly, they they uh, they adopted a budget line and um, and and managed to create a staff position and um, and it's a nice example of a way to to create the sustainability on the ground. Um, I would say that you know not every trade pool's you know uh, been successful in that regard. Um, Laos is ten years in the making, so that's that's a that's a good example of how it can occur in a low cost, um, low budget environment. And so that kind of works. I think what's most important is to probably um, think about connecting and integrating your trade information portals into the single window solution, because that way you can actually combine the sustainability. You can set a fee that's cost recoverable, um, and then you can manage the, the maintenance and, and ongoing costs. Unfortunately, we've uh, almost come to the end of the hour, uh, and uh, I'm particularly sorry since there's a lot of good questions in the chat, uh, which we're not going to be able to get to uh, a lot of questions about uh, good examples of single window implementation and uh, questions about uh, your experience uh, with the uh, uh, work that's been done uh, with national trade facilitation committees. Um, we'll have to have you back at some point, Bill, perhaps uh, to, pursue sure. the, to, yeah, yeah. To, to pursue this further. Uh, I will I will ask just one final question before our sign off. Uh, uh, if, if 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 someone is in a, a country that is not among the 56 countries that you are already active in, uh, what is a, a way in which to engage with you or with the TFSP program uh, uh, going forward? Um, that's very easy. I mean, through you, Paul, they can uh, you can you know, wrap the inquiry through to me. Um, my email, you can share my email. Uh, it's probably actually on the presentation somewhere. Um, you can contact me directly, um, or if you happen to be, you know, in in a country with a World Bank office, which we are in most countries, you can always, um, you know, uh, route your inquiry through the the local World Bank office um, or, um, you know, through the WTO. But you can do it direct for sure to right. me or through Paul. That would be the Thank easiest. You. Thank you. Bill, uh, let me extend my heartfelt thanks for uh, joining us, uh, particularly given how late it is uh, for you uh, where you are. I uh, hope you'll uh, get some shut eye afterwards. Uh, for those of uh, you who have uh, been with us through this presentation, thank you very much. Uh, Bill's uh, slides and the information uh, will be posted on the uh, Market Links uh, website uh, and will be available uh, for all. Uh, with that, uh, thanks everyone. Uh, 
appreciate your joining us and uh, Bill to you safe travels. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you to everybody. Really enjoyed it and look forward to coming back again one day. Thanks. All right. Goodbye, everyone.